Today, I'm interviewing Samara Zelniker. She is a longtime yoga instructor and a health and wellness expert out of LA. She is the founder of Mindfulness Matters, a holistic health practice where she supports corporate and private clients through all of her offerings for people to reach their highest potential. Welcome, Samara, to the Body Project Podcast. Hey, Catherine. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for joining me. We are in unprecedented time in the midst of a global pandemic. And although the Body Project podcast is typically interviewing fitness and movement professionals on how we optimize the health and the lives of our clients, this series, which we're doing because of this pandemic, is really about sharing hope, sharing some tangible things that people can do when they are in the midst of crisis so that they can move through the fear and panic that they're feeling more than ever before, right? So you and I go way back, right? You used to, I hired you as a yoga instructor in my fitness studio many years ago. And since then you have built and championed a movement in mindfulness Basically, when mindfulness was just at the beginning of the conversation in the mental health space, in self-development space, uh, and so you are a thought leader of our time, Samara, so I'm really excited to have you with us. So let's start with mindfulness and why it matters more now than ever before. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the kind words. And it's so amazing to be reconnected. It's um, awesome. I think, you know, when both people kind of go off and build their thing and they can come back together and, and just seeing the progress. So you two have built something really beautiful. So I'm excited to be a part of it. And um, I think, you know, the topic of your conversation and, and just the topic of your podcast in general is actually really quite relevant to everything that we're experiencing right now. That being that movement is so incredibly important to our mental health and our well-being. And how do we tie that back to the idea of mindfulness and why, why it matters ever and why it matters especially now. And so, you know, mindfulness can have a connotation for different people. You know, it's, it's a concept that could, you know, that was sort of born out of like Buddhist tradition. It's age old. It's something why I'm a champion, a pioneer for it is it's something that we can all access at any point. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have money. You don't have to have privilege. You don't have to, you know, have an education. Like it's really about something that anybody at any point can access. And really what mindfulness is, is it's the space between. So it's the space between our thoughts and our emotions. It's our, it's the space between the ability to respond versus react. It's the space between, um, stimulus and response really. So I, 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 if you're a visual person and you're listening to this, the way I think about it is like almost that space in your brain that allows for an opportunity to think about something before then going and reacting. Right. And I, I'm sure that we can all relate to the idea of something happens. We've gotten angry, whether it's like yelling at a partner, yelling at kids, whatever, and we react from it. Yeah. So the mindfulness practice is allowing yourself space of not going into that spiral of reactivity, but actually stopping and pausing. So that sacred pause. Mm -hmm. So I love the practice of mindfulness. I have a really extensive practice in myself and I often coach my clients around just the mindset of mindfulness, whether it's mindfulness meditations or just becoming more well aware, right? And I know that psychology today speaks about the practice of mindfulness being an actual practice, like you said, about the paying attention to that gap, being present in the moment with purpose and intention and without getting caught up with the judgment, like you said, of what external circumstances are going on now. And I would love for you to speak to that, right? Because people are so consumed, over consumed with the news of what is going on during this pandemic, that it is often difficult for people to even remember to be present within the moments of, I am safe, I am healthy, I'm doing everything to keep myself that way. So can you speak to us about how people can just start tuning in a little bit more to that frequency? Absolutely. So what you said so beautifully and clearly is that mindfulness is a practice, right? So it's not something you're just good at, or you just have, or you're just born with, but it's something that we practice the same way. If you were lifting up a weight and doing bicep curls, the more bicep curls you do, the stronger you become. So the more you practice mindfulness, which can be through meditation, which can be through breathing, which can be through movement, the better you get at it. So 
And knowing that it kind of brings the control back or the power back to us. Mm -hmm. Naturally, our minds, our default mode network is mind wandering, right? And the reason we know this or discover this was because scientists um, tested where our brains were in a brain scanner before they said, okay, this is what we're testing for, focus on this. The default mode was mind wandering. And what happens when our mind wanders? It's self-referential thinking. So we're thinking about ourselves, we're either worrying about something that may happen in the future or we're stressed about something that happened in the past. Hmm. And so by default, we're kind of at a deficit. That's because our brains are hardwired for survival, right? We're our amygdala, which is kind of that center of our brain that's responsible for threat and opportunity is always constantly monitoring on always wants to keep us alive right so if there's a threat we're going to naturally have a negativity bias towards focusing on that threat like thousands of years ago if we heard rustling in the bushes it could potentially be an animal coming to chase us and kill us we would start to run mm. in today's age that could look like giving a presentation nine people are nodding and smiling one person's looking down at their phone and frowning we automatically zero in on that one person so the same thing is happening with everything in the news right with these kind of sensationalized messages that we're getting. Mm. Of course, there is a standard of like needing to be safe, staying home, you know, six social distancing, covering your, your face with a mask and things like that. However, um, there is, there is a kind of boundary to all of that. Right. So it's, it's, it's noticing, okay, what do I need to do? what is happening in this moment? So really that practice of presence, like you said, I'm safe. I have a roof over my head. I have food. People in my family are healthy, assuming that that's all true for you. Yeah. Okay. Those are like my foundational elements, right? And then notice, oh wow, but what if this happens? What if this goes on for six more months? What if I get bankrupt? What if I don't have a job? What if I, you know, and just start to catch yourself. I call them spirals, right? And it's really spirals of your mind. of like noticing when you're spiraling into the future or spiraling back into the past. And those moments actually don't exist. They're things that aren't happening, right? And so how could I then come back to what's happening right here in this moment and catch yourself. And every single time you come back to what's happening in this moment, you're practicing. It's like that bicep curl, yes. right? So it's a practice of coming back. It's a practice of coming back. It's a practice of coming back. And the more you do that, the easier it becomes. Yes. And also knowing, like you mentioned that idea of shame, like, you know, it's, it's really about meeting yourself where you're at, because if this is an entirely new concept for you, or maybe you, you've heard of this before, you know, you should meditate, you know, you should, there's that word, that blame, that shame word of should, that's okay. Like the reality is like, you have to meet yourself where you are if you want to shift and change something. And so maybe you are getting stuck you know, in those spirals of negativity. And maybe you're noticing that that's triggered when you're watching a ton of news. Mm -hmm. So it's also being really conscious of like the variables and the, and the metrics that you're surrounding yourself with, because there's a lot of things that we do automatically that are so subtle that contribute to our mental health. That could be like maybe talking to a parent who's really paranoid. That could be watching the news. That could be you know, a myriad of different things. And now because we have the time and space, because we're not massively distracted, because we're not um, running from place to place to place, it's a lot easier to notice those subtleties. Oh, wow. I just watched the news for an hour. I noticed, I feel like shit. Okay. So maybe don't watch the news for an hour. Maybe have like one or two resources that you check every single morning. It can be the CDC website. It can be, you know, news outlets that aren't biased towards one way or another that are just giving you the straight facts. Maybe you speak to, you know, you check in on a parent, but you keep the conversation brief because you know that their energy is kind of dragging you down and you do what you need to do to keep your mental health on check. So maybe that's again, going out for a walk, taking, doing a breath practice, trying meditation or, or, you know, relying on a consistent practice, moving your body. And one thing that I get into with clients and with people all the time is they find that by doing those things, they think it's selfish. Well, I should be talking to my mom for an hour, or I should be doing like cooking and cleaning for every single person in the house. And while there's that word should again, there are certain responsibilities that you have. If you operate from making yourself number one, it's not selfish, it's service, right? Because then you're able to give way more to other people if you're operating from a full cup and you're operating from a mindful place, because not only does that make you feel better, you end up inspiring people around you. So it's like focus on you and yourself and like first, 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 because that then creates a ripple effect. It's the best thing you can do for other people 100%. Yeah. and you're not dragged down by their energy. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I actually speak about this every morning now. I've been running live classes with my clients on my online studio, and we speak about exactly this, that this is about self-compassion because when you can energetically bring yourself to a place that you feel, okay, I'm reminded that I'm safe and I'm okay and healthy, right? And even, I mean, we do it through movement, right? So that we can metabolize those stress hormones and, you know, boost up those endorphins and support our immune system. But even there, energetically, if you know that you are not shooting all over yourself and that you are adding in the self-compassion and saying, okay, you know, if you need a day of Netflix and chilling, right, with your brother, then that's what you need. And to say that's okay. And especially in an unprecedented time, like we're all in, nobody knows how they are reacting. Nobody knows because we've never been in a situation like this before. So I think you're absolutely right to bring that mindfulness practice back in to try things out different than before. Right. So I that's love the practice really. It's, it's not having anything be on the autopilot, right. But it's questioning the status quo around everything, especially now that we have the time and then being able to also take that practice back into like our everyday busy lives. Yes. Uh, one thing to remember is we're part of nature, right. And nature is constantly ebbing and flowing, right. It has seasons, the leaves fall off the trees, they grow back in beautiful bounty. Then they're stark and there's hibernation in winter. Right. So it's like, we're kind of the same, although we wake up expecting ourselves to feel the same, act the same, do the yes. same, be the same every single day. It's just not realistic, especially based on for women, our hormonal cycles, you know, men have different cycles that they, that they cycle through, but still it's, it's an ebb and flow. And so it's having that ability and that dialogue to non-judgmentally and compassionately check in with yourself and say, Hey, how am I feeling? Hey, what would I, what can I do to make today great? And it's going to, yeah, sometimes it's going to be like, actually, I think maybe it's going to be like taking a nap at 3 PM or it's going to be going for a run in the morning, or it's going to be like really brainstorming and working on something amazing. Right. So it's, it's just checking in and having that practice with yourself of like, how do I feel? What do I need? What do I want to create? Yeah. And I think right now resources like you are amazing to check in with, right? A lot of people I think are on social media more now than ever before and are consuming things that might put them in an anxiety state or overwhelm, right? But checking in with people like you, who like you recently did a live a couple weeks ago that spoke exactly about how do we manage throughout these times of unprecedented anxiety, right? And there are some amazing resources and, and in the show notes, I'll include everything so that you can get in touch with Samara and she does private coaching, she does corporate coaching. So if you have a corporation that your staff are also on high alert and anxiety, you know, she is an amazing resource of how do you support them to manage through that. But before I ask you about your own practices, I would love for you to share with us maybe one, two, three things people can do tangibly, like something that they can be like, okay, I tried that, you know, as a way to start moving through panic, anxiety, whatever people are dealing with right now. Sure. So there's a couple of things. There's a lot of really amazing things that you can do. And I'll kind of describe something in real time that you can do. If you notice um, in a moment that you're feeling really overwhelmed, you're feeling, you're feeling stressed and panicky and you're, you're noticing those spirals start mm -hmm. to come in. First thing would be to bring your awareness to your breath. Mm -hmm. And as simple as it sounds, it's really about taking three deep breaths. And a lot of the times when we breathe, we're actually breathing from our chest. So it's kind of shallow breathing, which ends up spiking our cortisol, which is our stress hormone, as opposed to breathing all the way down into our belly, which stimulates our parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and digest and just creates an overall sense of calmness. And so that, again, it's something that anyone can do in any single moment is just taking a deep belly breath. And I suggest doing three. I suggest taking the first breath down to your belly and just like asking yourself, and if you can, if you're in a place where you can close your eyes, what's, where's my mind? You know, where are my thoughts right now? Can I bring them back to this moment? Can I notice an anchor in my breath, right? So using your breath as an anchor, right? We all breathe. Can we practice bringing our awareness back to our breath? Second question as you take your second breath would be, how's my body feeling? Like, is it feeling relaxed? Is it feeling tense? Can I soften it? Can I bring my awareness back into my breath? Third question would then be just asking yourself, what's important now? And then letting it go. And then coming back into actually, you know, this moment, opening your eyes. And maybe what's important right now is, you know, you've got a 
pick up a screaming baby. Maybe what's important right now is you have to answer an email. Maybe what's important is that, you know, you need to go out for some fresh air for your mental health, right? So there's no right or wrong. But when you start to build a practice of checking in with yourself, I always say that like everyone has the answers. You have the own, your own answers. It's just about getting out of your own way and building in tools to be able to access what those answers are. By identifying with your thoughts, you notice, hey, am I being not present? Can I come back? Can I come back to the breath? By asking yourself what's happening in my body, a lot of the times we hold tension in our throat and our heart and our chest and our shoulders. We don't even realize we're doing it. Like if you're kind of one of those people, you go to the, the dentist and they're like, oh, do you do you um, grind? Yeah. yeah, grind your teeth or um, clench your jaw. And you're like, no, no, I'm good. No. And they're like, uh, yeah, you do actually, you know, because there's a lot of things that we do unconsciously. And so when we bring awareness to them, that's when we can shift off of autopilot to aware and we can choose something different. We can choose a different thought. We can choose a different action. And so I would say something like really tangible like that in the moment can be massively helpful. Another thing would be um, a naming or a noting practice. So a lot of the times when again, our thoughts are spiraling into the past or the future and we're not being present. We're worrying about things that aren't ever happening. We have about 60 to 70 thoughts a day. 90% of those thoughts are the same, right? So it's like that kind of hamster wheel or that mental chatter or that monkey mind that's just same thing over and over and over. And when we develop a mindfulness practice, what happens is we can start to let go of the thoughts that aren't serving us. And we can repopulate new thoughts that are serving us. And so when you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling overwhelmed, another great thing in the moment is naming five things that are happening in your space, right? So a lot of times when our focus is outwards, and there was a Harvard study that showed that 47% of the time we're doing something, we're thinking about something else. So that's like a lot of the time. It's insane, right? And so think about, you know, we're also busy and stuck on our to-do list. And imagine if you actually focused on the things that you did, like a hundred percent, how much quicker it would be, how much joy, more joy you would derive from it. Like maybe it's work, but maybe it's like having a meal and enjoying the food and, you know, or having a beautiful conversation with a friend or, you know, I, now go to the farmer's market every Sunday and I get flowers and, and I look at the flowers every day in my workstation. And I'm just like, Oh my God, these flowers are so beautiful. And just really like seeing and experiencing them. If I can't be out in nature, I'm going to bring nature into me. Um, so I would say that noting or naming practice, which would be like, okay, what's actually happening right now? Like I'm feeling stressed and overwhelmed and I'm worried about what may happen if I lose my job or I'm worried about what may happen if my parent gets sick or, you know, uh, again, a ton of different things right now. Can you stop and pause? All right, what's happening? Okay, right now I'm sitting on a chair. Right now I'm looking at beautiful flowers. Right now I'm recording a podcast. Right now I'm feeling healthy. Right now I'm feeling a bit hungry. Yeah, I think that was five, right? Yeah. So kind of just naming five things to come back. If you're noticing, again, you're spinning. So then go down to, so you start with five, then you go down to four. So naming four new things that are coming up. Okay, I just took a deep breath. Okay, I can hear some background noise. Okay, I can see my jasmine growing in and my planters outside. Okay, I can see my finished matcha on the table. All right, already I'm starting to feel a little bit calmer. Okay, let's go down to three. Mm. Okay, I'm wearing leggings. All right, my slippers are on the floor underneath me. I could feel myself take a deep breath. Mm. And then again, if you need more, go down to two and then go down to one. So like slowly just um, dropping more and more into your sympathetic, parasympathetic mm -hmm. nervous system mm -hmm. and creating that um, atmosphere for decompression yes which is the total opposite of like ramping up and like those spirals right which like energetically create that stress yes. Yes. and so we're so good at that i i was listening to a, a meditation actually this morning another great resource right now is uh, deepak chopra and oprah are doing these free yes 21 day meditations that they do quarterly and they have one right now which is like uncertainty and or hope in a time of uncertainty and Oprah quoted Tony Robbins, and she said that he, he, one of his theories is that we're actually like hardwired for fear, which mm -hmm. is similar to what I shared about the default mode network. And he said, 
fear is a highway, whereas happiness is a dirt road. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier to take the highway. So again, with these practices, which again, any single person can access, it is work. So just kind of know that, that if you're again, spiraling or feeling overwhelmed or feeling anxious, like a lot of people are feeling that way and there's nothing wrong with that, but right. and it's an, it's an option to ask yourself, well, is, does this feel good? Yeah. Is this serving me? And most of the time, the answer to that is going to be no. All right. Well, I have the option to choose something different. There's no pressure. Like no one's taking away your fear if you want to hold on to it. However, there is a different option. Just know that that's possible. Yeah. I love that. So the other day I had an interview with Dr. Jillian Mandich, who is the happiness doctor in Canada, and she spoke about a gratitude practice. But I love this tool of the noting and naming because it even simplifies it a little bit more, right? Because when people are fear stricken, sometimes they can't remember that to be grateful for just being able to breathe, but just the noting almost removes yourself and brings you back in to be present going inwards instead of going outwards. So I really love that. So I will make sure that those tools that Samara just shared with us are in the show notes. Um, I would love for you to share maybe a gratitude, sorry, a mindfulness practice that you've taken on for the last little while, or maybe one that you just recently adopted because of having a little bit more time at home. Absolutely. Well, it's funny because... I, I'm pretty non-negotiable about my morning routine. Like I, you know, usually wake up, I work out, I walk my dog, I make myself a matcha, I'll meditate, I'll journal. And I remember some mentors of mine a while back had said like, yeah, we only start our day at 11. And I was like, that's crazy. How do they do that? I would never be able to do that. I have so many things to do, but like these people were like so much more successful than me and like, you know, just kind of living this life that I wanted. And now I'm, I'm pretty... Um, non-negotiable about not starting my day and, and not I, of course I start my day in, in kind of that robust morning routine but I don't take any outside calls I don't really look at my phone because mm. uh, again your phone is everyone else's to-do list for you right. I try and not go on Instagram or any sort of social media before that time as well so that's something I already had in place and it's shifted around a little bit just for the sheer fact of like I'm not going out to make a workout class right now. I need the motivation of kind of doing it in my living room. But one thing that I have shifted that I'd really wanted to shift for a while is creating my bedroom to be a digital detox zone and to not actually have my phone in, in the bedroom at all, uh, which is really, really nice. Cause again, it creates that initial, um, practice of not looking at your phone first thing in the morning. And although if I'm waking up and I'm doing a workout and then obviously, putting it on my phone and putting it on the TV, or if I'm doing a Deepak Chopra and over meditation, I'll, I'll access it that way, but I'm not immediately checking emails, you know, social media. People, yeah. What other people kind of need for me. So that's been a really, really great practice. I think, you know, also just naturally, you know, like you, I have a pretty deep mindfulness practice that exists already. So that's also why I think that this time doesn't feel so like jarring or scary because I think, you know, with a mindfulness practice, you get to have a handle on your thoughts and they're not spinning. And, and the idea of a mindfulness practice, isn't that like you're mindful in the good times. It means like, you know, you get to really like use it and pull it out when things are challenging and yeah. things are hard. And so I'm really grateful. And even all my one-on-one -on -one clients, like I feel like the first call I had with them when this happened, everyone was sort of freaking out. And then the second call, they were like, oh no, we, we, re we see the silver lining. We see the opportunity for yes. growth here. And I was like, yes, that's because we're working on a mindfulness practice, which is exactly what we want. And again, something that everyone can have access to. And I, you know, I would say that's probably like the biggest change. And then the second thing is just like when things come up, you know, because there is space and time is processing them. Like, for example, I woke up this morning. I just had like a deep feeling of sadness that came up out of nowhere mm. and it had nothing to do with like any outside factors. It was like my own processing of stuff. And I, you know, hung out in bed with my boyfriend and we chatted about it for like 30 minutes, which was just so nice. Like usually I'm running out or he's running out and like I got, you know, felt like I like got to the root of something. And I, I don't even know that if during my regular life, I would even like notice that or be able to access it. And so I think, you know, every single emotion for us is information, every single one, anger, sadness, you know, happiness, joy, 
everything is information. And so the opportunity to like sort of dissect that data for like what makes up that blueprint of your life only helps understand yourself better and give you more tools of like how to deal with like your own personal stuff and then communicating and, and connecting with others. So I, I'm really grateful for that. And I would say, you know, I, I suggested some two practices in the moment that could be really helpful. And like, like the happiness doctor mentioned, gratitude is so important. So if you guys have a journaling practice and if you don't, this would be a really, really great time to start one. I tell my clients all the time, um, how powerful it is just kind of in brain dumping. So remember that 60,000 thoughts a day and things, the mental chatter going over and over and over the practice of journaling allows you to let go of those thoughts and there's a place for it to live. And what I like to provide people with, especially who don't currently have a practice, because sometimes it can feel really daunting of like, what do I write? I remember when I started journaling, like now probably five years ago, I was like, I don't freaking know. I'm not a writer. Like, I don't know what I'm going to write. Like it felt very intimidating to me. And so I often give people three prompts, which are, you know, writing down three things you're grateful for. And from a neural pathway perspective, back to the idea that, you know, if we focus on negative, we're going to see more negative. But if we focus on positive, we're naturally going to see more positive. And that's a neuroscience fact, right? So like you're what fires together, wires together. And so again, we, our our brains, the from the, from the neural pathway perspective, aren't saying like, oh, I'm going to be more negative or I'm going to be more positive. They're just going to like go from A to B in the quickest way possible because our brains are the biggest supercomputers that you can imagine. And so if you're constantly like, you know, driving to work in the same way, your, your brain is going to want to drive to work that way because it doesn't have to think about it, right? Versus if you decided to take another route, you'd have to actually pay more attention. Exactly. And so it's the same with thoughts, right? So if you're used to thinking those negative thoughts, if you're, if you're used to being operating out of a fear-based mentality, then A to B, quickest way possible is to stay in fear, right? But if you're deciding that, hey, I want to shift to love, hey, I want to shift to gratitude, that's going to take some work to go from C to D now, right? So we're shifting the neural chemistry. And then, you know, over time, similar with bicep curls and we get stronger and stronger, then that becomes a mental habit. And so journaling is really helpful at shifting the chemistry around that. Um, The prompts that I often give people are like three things that I'm grateful for. How was I kind to myself? So if you're doing it in the morning, it can be from the day before. If you're doing it in the evening, it can be that day. What do I want to let go of? Like maybe it's a thought that's on repeat that you're just, um, that's just not serving you. Mm. And what do I want to create or manifest, right? So depending on kind of what your practice is, um, knowing that your thoughts create your actions, your actions create your life. So taking that control and that power back is like what you think about becomes your reality. So it's like, what do I want to think about? What do I want to create? And maybe it's this vision for my life in six years from now, or maybe it's like, I want to cook a soup play tomorrow. Like it can, you know, there's no right or wrong, but, um, but being intentional about it makes all the difference. Yeah. I love that. And actually one of the practices that I have for all the moms listening now that we're all homeschooling is that I have the five minute journal for kids and it actually goes through similar to this, three things you're grateful for. What is your intention for the day and an affirmation? Like I am strong. I am confident. I'm happy. And so these are amazing so that any parents listening, you can use these two with your kids. It's actually a beautiful way to teach them to be intentional with their day as well as to be grounded in how they're feeling in these moments, right? And to give them the practice of mindfulness, right? What a beautiful opportunity as parents right now to give, and even if you're not a parent, give your partner, give your friends, when you're sitting online having a glass of wine with your friends, you know, an opportunity to have these conversations, to share your own practices. Because I think it is, like you said, a beautiful time to see the light and the silver lining in the crisis and the darkness, right? Absolutely. And as we're connecting virtually, it's an opportunity to really deeply connect with people. I know, you know, when I started developing these practices, I was like, I don't have any more time for small talk. Like I only want real talk. I only want deep talk. And so, you know, you can't really get on Zoom with a face-to-face call, whether you're a group of friends or one friend or colleagues or whatever that looks like and sort of hide behind small talk really. Um, And notice also if you're doing that, notice if like, you know, you're getting on a call and all you're talking about is like the fear around the pandemic or when is it going to be over? And 
what does it look like to go past that? And using something like a five minute journal or prompts, like ultimately we're all high, hardwired for connection and we all crave that. So it may feel uncomfortable if that's not something you're used to at first, but then I guarantee you it will bring you closer to the people in your life. Um, that's first and foremost. Second thing, like doing this with kids, that's amazing. That's incredible. It's so powerful. I'm, you know, I think that that's, that's the secret really to all this is to create mindful kids and a, a different generation of mindfulness. I was actually listening to a podcast yesterday with the psychotherapist Esther Perel and she talked about how, and I, I don't remember what she said about our grandparents generation, but she said they were a certain economy. Our parents were a service economy and then we're an identity economy. Mm -hmm. And so we're really about like who we are and how that shows up in like, businesses that we create in branding and marketing and you know services we put out it's really about identity and so I think that equipping your kids with a really strong sense of identity and knowing who they are and giving them tools to be able to explore that because our parents generation and grandparents generation didn't really talk about that like that wasn't really a luxury or an option that they have it was more like we have to do we have to create we have to you know provide you know and, and although we have those same pressures there's more pressures because we're so connected and because we have so many options and choice that identity and who we are has to be paramount because we're not staying in jobs for 20 30 years which you would happily identify with people aren't staying in marriages for 50 years which is again something you would happily identify with you may not be living in the same place that you grew up which is again something you would happily identify with so knowing who you are and having a really strong sense of identity is is paramount to your overall success, your mental success, all of that. And so what a, what a great time to be able to dive into this right now, like really and truly like the fact that we have time, which is our only non-renewable resource. Yes. And we can never get enough of it. And now we have a lot of it. It's like, okay. And, and this is the time. This is the time. Yeah. And again, you know, maybe that's not the reality for some people who are now homeschooling their kids and, mm. you know, dealing with things, but, um, now you have the time to help shape the identity of your kids. And, you know, there is a, it's a different kind of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. And thank you for sitting down with us today and sharing your wisdom. And I think these tools are so tangible and so relevant. So I thank you for sharing those also. Oh, this is a blast. Thank you so much for having me. I, I feel like we could go on chatting about this for hours and hours. We could do it again after, yeah. after yeah. even during, depending on how long this goes for, we can absolutely share the conversations and your wisdom to support people exactly where they are. So thank you so much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for creating this platform, Catherine. I know you're helping so many people. You're so sweet. Thank you. Mm -hmm.